Welcome to the Psychedelia Podcast, where we talk about the third wave of psychedelics. Through our many wide-ranging conversations with scientists, policymakers, entrepreneurs, and event organizers, we bring you an exclusive look into the many minds of the psychedelic world. It's time to let the word out about psychedelics and how they can be used as tools to benefit both the individual and the community. Welcome to the third wave. Hey, listeners, and welcome back to the Psychedelia Podcast. We have, as always, a super special guest for you, but even more super special than all the other guests, but maybe not. His name is Mike Margulies. He is the expansion director at Symposia. Uh, Mike and I met a couple months ago in person at the Beyond Psychedelics Conference in Prague, where he slept on the floor of my Airbnb. <laughs> True hobo style. And now <laughs> I've brought him on here just to talk about Symposia and talk about his experience with psychedelics and all other things that we just want to talk about. So Mike, thanks, dude. What's up? Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah. And thank you for having me, letting me crash at your place in Prague. <laughs> yeah, that was a super, super fun event. I, I loved the ukulele that you brought along, which I think you had sold your guitar just so that you could bring a ukulele along. On I, I trade while well, I was traveling uh, yeah, I had been on the road for like a month and I was traveling with a guitar and it just was heavy. And I was saying to uh, my travel buddy, Chris, who also crashed uh, like on your couch or floor. And then I had a ukulele. <laughs> and did that work out? Like, were you happy about that? Trip? Oh, yeah. Way easier to travel uh, with a ukulele than a full size guitar if you're on the road for several weeks at a time. Absolutely. So what I mean, <laughs> why why were you at the the conference in Prague in the first place? What was the reason for that? Yes. So uh, well, as you know, tell your audience, my organization, Symposia, we're, we're uh, an events group and a digital magazine uh, focused. Uh, we kind of focus at the intersection of psychedelics and drug policy reform. So we have events, uh, our signature event, uh, which I hosted a session of at the conference is psychedelic stories, where basically what we do is as distinct from what you would have at the conference, a lot of presentations and people you know, showing their work. We have people go to a more personal level, get up on the microphone and just tell a story from the heart of that personal experiences. And that's one of our kind of signature events we've done around well around the world now. Uh, and then in parallel to that, we run a digital magazine at symposia.com, which is symposia spelled with a P, P S. Y-M-P-O-S-I-A. And on our digital platform, which is all free available there, we cover similar issues like psychedelic stories, or we cover what's going on in the world of drug reform or in psychedelic science, or we even sometimes question the community itself. In what ways? In what ways would you question the community? I mean, is, are you talking in specific reference to these kind of pieces that you've published as of late? Yes. Yeah, so specifically, this week, for example, we have been running a conversation series called the Psychedelic Diversity Conversation. And so this week, every day this week, we release a new piece with a different perspective on the series. And what this series is doing is, is actually looking internally at the psychedelic community itself and asking the question of, you know, why is the psychedelic community very white and how do we make it? And to be constructive about it, how do we make it more diverse? We got people from around the community um, to share opinions and perspectives on this. And yeah, so that sort of thing in that way, we're kind of poking back at our own community in a sense. And why do you think those constructive conversations are important to have? Because clearly this is something that I've talked about with you and I've talked about with other people. My friend Brian, I've talked about it with kind of, it's kind of been lurking under the surface for a while. And it's, it's interesting that you guys brought it up into kind of the internet. You brought it up into the, the dialogue and the conversation that's now happening on, on Twitter feeds and in social media and wherever it might be. Why is the psychedelic community so white? Why do you think that is? I think really it's, it's not just you know the psychedelic community, right? This is something that happens on many levels of the society where certain circles are not as diverse as they could be or not as reflect, not reflective of the overall society. It's really not an issue that's specifically about this community it's about a lot of our it just reflects the overall culture in a lot of ways or certain aspects of you know the overall culture and i think for us and i'm always a fan of like a um a be the change kind of mentality right so in a way we're um, i almost see it as a commentary on much broader things in the psychedelic community but we are posing the questions about our own community because i think that's a more constructive 
way to go about it. I think it speaks to a much broader message, but rather than saying, oh, this is a thing, I don't know the answers for all of society, but you know, we can at least look at ourselves and say, hey, what can we, what can we do to be better about this thing? And then maybe the broader conversation, you know, people who might see this can draw from that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that where you're taking that is a really interesting direction in terms of the, the reflection the psychedelic community has in comparison to maybe mainstream society where we do tend to put a lot of attention on white, privileged people who have wealth, even though they don't necessarily make up a vast majority of the actual people who are operating and existing within our society. And obviously what you guys are doing at Symposia, discussing this convergence between psychedelics and policy reform is right at the crux of that because you know, probably one reason why the psychedelic community is so white, one reason why there aren't as many people um, who are black or Hispanic or even as many women as men who are participating in some of these conferences or going to some of these events or speaking at some of these conferences is because it's riskier from oppressed minority groups to be more open about their active drug use in light of the federal government's basically incarceration of massive amounts of minorities, you know, while the drug war has been going on in the past 50 or 60 years. Yeah, it, it is. It's funny. And Natalie Ginsberg of MAPS was one of the writers for the series. And she talks about some of this, about how she asked the question, like, how can a criminalized community be privileged? And it's an interesting thought, right? So in one sense, it is criminalized and it isn't, we are oppressed in one perspective there were people do go to jail for using psychedelics mm -hmm. and it is terrible at the same time it, from a relative perspective relative to other communities there's a relative privilege there in the sense that i can go to events around the world i can stand up on a stage at a microphone and host an event called psychedelic stories where mm -hmm. people get on the stage and talk completely openly about their experience like you wouldn't see an event like heroin stories or something right, you right. Know? <laughs> so it, it's interesting and, and um it's actually reading the pieces that we receive from people, it's causing me to do reflection. I think that's what psychedelic experience is about, ultimately, right, is this self-reflection thing. Mm -hmm. And so if we're not doing that on our platform, then we're almost doing a disservice to the spirit of psychedelics in general. That's a big part of it. And I had, oh, should I have another thought? I just lost my train. That's okay. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. This, this concept of reflection, right, this concept of seeing right. things as they are of really looking and, at things honestly and then constructively working to improve them. And I think a huge part of what the psychedelic community needs to do going forward um, to be more inclusive is having more of these these conversations and having more of these yeah. voices play a more prominent role. Yeah, and I just remember the thought I had is that, um, you know, what we don't want to do as Symposia is not interested in playing the game of reverse propaganda. You know, so we suffer from this propaganda for decades of drugs are bad, drugs are bad. And we don't want to just be the opposite of that and just be putting things out about, hey, look how great drugs are. Look how great the psychedelic community is. Look how great uh, all these things are. But we want to be more honest. We want to be more mature. And we want to be self-reflective in that sense. It's just a more genuine thing. And, I, and honestly, I don't necessarily even personally agree with every single point that every single writer put in this conversation. The whole purpose of having these conversations. We had another conversation series previously on coming out of the psychedelic closet. And similarly, it was... We had some writers say, yeah, coming out of the psychedelic closet is a social justice issue akin to coming out of the closet as gay. And other people reacted to that and said, no, actually, you can't compare these. These are asymmetric risks to these two, idea these two versions of coming out. And I think for us, it's not about like pushing some kind of propaganda, pushing an agenda, pushing a certain view or message, but it's about we want to create the space for the conversations to happen from the different perspectives and maybe figure out like, well, maybe these two views are can be right at the same time, or maybe in having these different views portrayed, we can move a little bit forward towards reconciling them and coming to a more complete view, which we'll never fully get to. But I think that's the point is let's just how do we take things forward. Yeah, we will never fully get to it, I think, because there's so many different voices and there's so many different types of people and there's so many different stories that are being intertwined in this, you know, story of, of society and the story of our communities and the story of our our regions that to come to one definitive answer for any of these topics or subjects would be impossible because what works for one person or what 
what one person may perceive from their story, from their life is obviously going to be much different from another person. I mean, coming back to the example in in terms of people of color or people from oppressed communities who are in in the psychedelic community, someone who has taken psychedelics and is not as well off or maybe not as wealthy or maybe not white, um, their story about why they took psychedelics, their story about what happened as a result of that, it's probably going to be different from someone like me, who comes from a very middle class, very open, very supportive family, uh, where I've had the privilege to do certain things that other people haven't. And so understanding those different stories, and, and like you said, providing space for them to happen is uh, is such an important part in in terms of moving this conversation forward. Because like you said, with all the propaganda that's been going on from a federal government perspective, uh, it's it's been difficult, if not impossible, for people to actually make informed decisions. And, mm-hmm. you know, by providing these uh, spaces for people to have constructive discussions online, people finally have an ability to understand and make decisions based on their life situation. Like you said, that doesn't mean that, for example, psychedelics aren't for everyone, but for those who are interested in them or those who want to try them, at least they have this understanding of how to navigate that experience and what it might mean for their personal identity. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so tell us then, speaking of psychedelic stories, you should tell our audience live on the call <laughs> right now. I'm just I'm going to stall a little bit longer so that you have time to think of a psychedelic story. You should tell us a psychedelic story from Mike Margulis uh, of I Symposia. Can. Name a drug. <laughs> mm, let's pick LSD. I wish we could do like live tweeting right now. We should do that in a future podcast <laughs> where we like live tweet our audience like, okay, so Mike from Symposia is about to tell a psychedelic story. <laughs> Which drug do you want him to tell you about? This is what I do at the events. Um, do you? <laughs> if I, well, I, 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 really, it's about create, like you said, creating the space for people. So, as much as possible, I would always defer to other people to tell their stories. That's more so. But if it needed, I'll tell one. So that's my technique. If, uh, if I gotta tell a story, I'll say, well, what, what drug do you want to hear about? So LSD. I guess maybe like the first time I did LSD is a good story. It's yeah, good I think thing. that's that's an excellent place to start. <laughs> and then um, I can maybe tell mine as well if, if, if that's something that I, that, that I feel is, sure. is appropriate. <laughs> yeah, LSD is the first psychedelic that uh, I did, um, unless you count marijuana, which can be psychedelic. But yeah, so at this time, you know, a buddy of mine had some acid and I didn't know what to expect. I had been fascinated by the idea of psychedelics. Like, what does it mean to hallucinate? You know, like this whole premise to me was fascinating. I think that's what drew me to them. I was like, I need to understand, like, if there's something, you can just take some molecule, right? And it can make you see things. Uh, And what does that mean? Like, what does that mean about our whole perception of reality? That that whole premise is just fascinating to me. So um, we did this acid and I was living in Northern Virginia at the time. So we took this acid and we went to the Smithsonian Museums in Washington, D.C. And the funny thing about it is it was so underwhelming. (laughs) Like I was expecting it to be like seeing shit that wasn't there, hallucinating, Mm, right? mm, mm, mm. Um, And it wasn't like that at all. It was actually like, well, the world is just a little bit more interesting. Mm-hmm. You, know, <laughs> you know, everything just had more meaning. It was so much more subtle than I had imagined. Now, maybe if I had taken 10 hits of acid, I would have had a different first time doing acid story. Mm-hmm. But that was the thing that struck me the most about the the experience was like how underwhelming it was. But it was an awesome day. I wasn't seeing shit that wasn't there, but we're going around and, you know, just not even necessarily the art than the exhibit but it would be just oh wow this plant here i never noticed the colors on this on this leaf here and just the insights that came random in life insights that came that day and uh yeah i think i have since then had actual like hallucinations but less it's less like of a visual like seeing something that's not there more so when i hallucinate it's more like a mental hallucination like yeah, it's, a situation yeah, right. happening that's not really happening right. <laughs> it's like a mental mind fuck we could call yeah, it, yeah. where like you take, you eat a little too many shrooms and you're like, did I create the world or was it <laughs> right. here before me? 
Right, right. And for me, I, you know, I, I've been in the space, too, of having like the super paranoid, schizophrenic state of mind, um, which is not a pleasant one. And so, um, but it's an important part of the story, too. If you're going to be some, you know, as somebody who is talking about psychedelics, I, you know, like I said, I'm not trying to be reverse propaganda and just say, oh, yeah, psychedelics are great. Like, no, you should be afraid of psychedelics. They can be fucking terrifying. So, yeah, and I think that's an important aspect as responsible people to, you know, I don't know, I wouldn't call myself an advocate for psychedelics, but more so an advocate for honesty about psychedelics. Yeah, and I think that's a really good way of putting it, you know, understanding that there are risks in doing these, understanding that there are certain people who probably shouldn't do psychedelics. Mm -hmm. I definitely like people who uh, have schizophrenia or a tendency from family history to have schizophrenia shouldn't be touching these. But also understanding that there are tremendous benefits when we look at psychedelics as tools for specific changes within our subjective experience of life and um, understanding then you know once the propaganda gets stripped away once the misinformation the disinformation gets stripped away people can actually make decisions rational decisions based on real information rather than operating in some type of shadow space where you know they're hearing information like if i take lsd seven times i'm deemed like legally insane which is a bunch of horseshit obviously right Right. Like, like that's so fucked up. Yeah. Like, that's there's not just, true There's a lot of lies. Yeah, there's a lot of lies about the whole, all of drugs, really. This is, well, on a tangent a little bit, that's what's, what's funny is almost ironic about the psychedelic, uh, here's another challenge to the psychedelic community that I'll issue, is like, you know, we are so many, not everybody, but you know, most people in this community, okay, we get it, right, there were lies told about marijuana, about LSD, about MDMA. And we can see how, okay, this, what we have been told is not true. And so we get that. But somehow there's a, still a big portion of the community that when you bring up, say, heroin, and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, but heroin should be illegal. And, there, and granted, yes, I'm acknowledging here there are certainly more risks to heroin than there are to LSD. You're not going to overdose on LSD like you could on heroin. Um, LSD is also it, not addictive. Addictive, like opiates, exactly. Heroin, there are right. absolutely more risks. That said, it's like, you know, there are people, I do know people that are functional heroin users. It's not this thing that, okay, you do this once and you're addicted forever. It's not this thing that if you sell heroin, you're evil. You know, for, maybe there are some people that are, that are taking advantage in that. But I just kind of find it to be interesting. Uh, and this is another, this is an example coming back to the whole privilege thing of, you know, like, you can, this is where psychedelics versus heroin, there's like a, a distinction there between the users. Like the users of these drugs are viewed differently. And, you know, of course, there are differences. Like I said, I, I won't deny that. I think, uh, like I said, I, I want to be honest on all these drugs about what are the risks, what are the benefits. But I do find it interesting. And it's a challenge I want, I always want to issue within the drug reform circles is like, don't play the my drugs are better than your drugs game. <laughs> Play the understand what the the risks and what the potential benefits are of each substance, and if you decide yes. to use them, you know, be informed about about what your use may bring. And Absolutely. you know, I think like from a benefits perspective, there's probably more benefits to taking uh, a substance like psilocybin or LSD compared to heroin in terms of. The depends though, right? Heroin is diamorphine. You call it a different name. It has a whole different connotation to it. Mm -hmm. And diamorphine is what's used in hospitals in the UK, same as we use morphine here. It's the same. It, it, that's heroin. We just call it a different name and we administer it a different, different set and setting, right? So just like set and setting and dosage applies to psychedelics, it applies to heroin. Set, setting, and dosage is part of the equation here. Yeah, and, and that's a really good point. It's about the context in which in yeah. which we use it. It's about the the time and it's about the place and it's about the situation in which we use it, which can which makes a decision about whether or not it might be beneficial or harmful. So that 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 is a good point. That is a good point and I think that brings up, you know, I mean if we want to take that road we could about all drugs obviously should be legalized and regulated there are some drugs that have less risks than others there are some drugs that are mm -hmm. less harmful than others but the legality and illegality of current drugs has nothing to do with those uh, cost risk oh, profiles because definitely obviously doesn't have anything no because yeah. obviously substances like alcohol and tobacco are uh, you know have the potential to be much more harmful 
than ecstasy and LSD and magic yeah. mushrooms in terms of physical addiction, in terms of uh, right. possibility of overdosing, in terms of... But you're also um, not going to go paranoid schizophrenic on heroin. Other thing. So, you know, there's different risks, let's say. Right. Um, I think, the thing is, like, yeah, the legality, has, there are risks with every drug, and it's like putting people into cages because you prohibited the substance because you just deemed it to be bad is missing the point. Like, no, we want to help people. So you want to provide on the case of psychedelics, how do you mitigate the risks of psychedelics? Well, you provide the containers, you can do them. How do you mitigate the risks with heroin? Well, you know, you have safe injection facilities. You make sure people, what they're getting, they know they're getting the actual correct substance, not something laced with fentanyl or something, right? Um, you, and, you, and people who have addiction, you, you know, it's a radical concept. How do you help somebody you, with addiction? Well, you help them. <laughs> having compassion is a big part uh, that, of the equation that's missing from the entire prohibitionist mentality is there's the you, once you're a drug user you have lost your humanity and that's part of what we do in symposia is my our, our part of our, our driving purpose is to humanize drug users which has been done in societies in the past i mean the romans used to drink wine with opium in it you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so like Drug use has not been stigmatized in previous societies. It's only with the onset of kind of this patriarchal, Christian-dominated society that we live in that all of a sudden drugs have been stigmatized so heavily, at least to the degree that they are. Yeah, well, it's certainly, I don't know what stigmas there were weren't in previous times, but certainly there hasn't been mass incarceration and in some cases, killing, like we're seeing in the Philippines right now, 2016, this seems to be a unique situation. Maybe there are, this is in the past where this has happened, but it's definitely no, not good that, that today, 2016, for choices people make, they're going into cages and being killed on the streets. It's not a great situation. And, and why, why is that, do you think? Why do, does society as a whole lack compassion or not bring compassion to people who use drugs and people who oh, are interested in drugs. Oh, it's propaganda, right? I mean, we know why. What was the report that one of Nixon's aides, uh, actually, I'll pull it up right now. You know, it, it's, it, this is hidden in plain sight. Nixon campaign in, the, uh, in 68 and the White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. This is one of Nixon's top aides as a direct quote from him. So what's the reason? It's it was deliberate propaganda. <laughs> and there's your that, that's the real answer. It's And this is ties back into the, the race conversation, like part of the drug war, a big aspect of the drug war was inherently racial in nature. In the U.S., this, the drug war is what replaced Jim Crow, and it's the means that we have currently in the United States 2.2 million people in prisons. That's as much as China and Russia combined. It's more people in prison like ever in any country in history, I'm fairly certain, and this is by design. That was the purpose. It was to control and and what does it what does it propagate? So why do you think you know? And I totally agree with you. It is a matter of propaganda. It is a matter of placing blame. It is a matter of disrupting systems. Why would Nixon or why does even our current administration, uh, whether that's Obama or whether that's Trump, you know, why do they still vilify substances, even though most people are starting to wake up to that it is part of the propaganda machine? Yeah, I, I think it's if you're asking me to go into Donald Trump's head and understand what his motivations are, that is a difficult task. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, that's, you know, like, why did Nixon and these top aides want to vilify drugs? You know, why did they want control. to break up the hippie they had, These were communities that were, um, they were threatening to the powers that be. The anti-war movement and the black communities that are now fighting for their civil rights, you know, like they're fighting against oppression. These uh, threats, right? So what do you do to a community that is threatening? Well, you find some you know, ways to control. You find, and that's what happened. They just found these, there are these channels that are used to control uh, members of the population. And so it's, it's about power. It's about control. I mean, what's it not about? It's not about 
compassion. It's not about helping people with drug problems. It's not about mitigating the risks of drugs. If you were trying to help people and mitigate risks of drugs, you would help people and mitigate risks of drugs. But it's not what it's about. But it's, it's changing. Yeah, it's changing. I yeah. I you know I I'd like to think so. I think certainly we've seen progress, and you know Obama was making efforts towards you know he was giving pardons and helping with this mass incarceration thing and all everything we're seeing with the psychedelic research is um, super promising. You know, MAPS just like what, two days ago, right, got approval from the FDA to enter into their phase three trials. So lots of positive indicators, but, and you know, had all these states legalizing marijuana in the, in the recent election. These are all really solid indicators of progress. That said, we just elected Donald Trump. So what does that mean? And I don't think we even know what that means yet. There's a part of me that wants to believe it's going to be okay and we're going to keep the progress going. But there's a part of me that's like, you know, maybe he's the next Nixon. Um, and it's, I think there's a lot of uncertainty right now about where is this going to go? I think ultimately, you know, what I think this is an MLK line, right? The, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. So I think in the long run, yes. But I don't, you know, what did Obama say after he, uh, after the election? He's like, you know, progress isn't a straight line. Sometimes you take steps backward. And I don't know what phase we're going into right now. Uh, it's, it's a big question. Um, it I is a big question, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I hope that we can move things, keep them moving in a positive direction. But in a lot of ways, man, even the supposed liberalization of drugs is mirroring the same systems of oppression, right? Like you've got marijuana becoming legalized, but okay, but then you got to ask the question, legalized for who, you know? So in order to, in most states, in order to open a legal uh, marijuana dispensary, but yeah, if you want to open up a, if you want to be in the legal marijuana market, you got to have thousands of dollars. So you have to probably have political connections. So, that, you know, again, it's this question of, privilege, right? And it's pretty fucked up when you have one group of people, say a low-income black community that has been oppressed for decades for selling drugs. And now you've said, okay, actually it's okay to, to sell drugs now, but that entire community gets largely boxed out from the legal industry. So the community, the same community that was jailed for doing this activity, selling drugs, uh, no, now does not have access to the legal market of selling drugs. It's like, okay, it was not okay when you did it. It's okay, though, now for these people to do it. And so in a, in a way, like I said, we try to supposedly question, push back on the community itself. We publish pieces like this, questioning the way that marijuana legalization is happening, because in many ways, it is reproducing the exact same oppressions in a different form. But do you think that's being overly critical? Because at the same time, you know, I would argue that with the legalization of cannabis now in eight states, just the fact that it's legal and being regulated and, you know, it's opening up tremendous opportunities, like you said, for mostly white privileged people. But it's also, you know, I think pushing the conversation forward and helping people understand that marijuana use is not what the government told them it was and that marijuana use is not what um, what they thought it was before. And I think that's a hopeful sign for, for example, the psychedelic movement who where MDMA might be medicalized within, you know, five years for specific purposes. So while I understand that side of things, I think it's also important to acknowledge the progress that has been made to acknowledge the benefits that are now on the table as a result of of legalization and to acknowledge that although to acknowledge that also we're just at this really really interesting crossroads between federal rights and state rights with eight states having legalized uh, marijuana uh, and now a conservative government coming into power where the where the um, uh, sessions what what mm, Jeff, yeah, Jeff sessions yeah uh, attorney general, attorney I believe. general. yeah who mm -hmm. he says good people don't smoke marijuana like, you have to be fucking kidding me. I consider myself to be a fairly good person, and I smoke a lot of marijuana. Me as too. well as you do, as well as a lot of our friends do, as well as a lot of people 
that are really great people. And so I think the interesting thought to have and conversation to have going forward is, and obviously all we can do is guess, but yeah. what will happen with, with these eight states that have now legalized cannabis um, in comparison to this, this conservative government that's coming in. So this yeah. is going to be an interesting uh, tightrope to, to it will be. Yeah, it will be interesting to see how it pans out. You know, is he gonna? Is the federal government gonna try to impose itself on these states? I don't know how it's all gonna shake out. And you know, and you're right. Like, there is a pot. It's not all bad. You know, there are aspects of legalization that I question, but there's also this good aspect. Like the fact that it is happening, it is changing the conversation. That is all positive stuff. I guess for me, it's just important that we not lose. You know, marijuana is legalized in Colorado. Great, but the problem with marijuana being illegal was never that middle-class white people didn't have access to marijuana. The problem is that people were going into cages for yes. marijuana. And since legalization in Colorado, those rates are even more disproportionate. Uh, people of color even more disproportionately are going into jail versus white people for uh, marijuana. You know, because, you know, there's people that are selling marijuana on the black market uh, still. And there's still people in Colorado where marijuana is legalized who are going into cages for selling marijuana. Hmm. And so it's like, so yes, there is... Um, it's good that marijuana has been legalized from the perspective of it's progressing the conversation, it's changing attitudes, that's all positive. But at the same time, it's like if we legalize, quote unquote, but people are still going into cages for those drugs, to me, we've almost kind of fundamentally missed the point of why it was bad that drugs were illegal. And the, the reason it was bad was because people's human rights are being violated. And that's, it's like, yeah, it's legal, but it kind of missed the point. It, right. it missed the fundamental thing. Right, and so there, there's still work to be done, essentially. Yes, a lot of work to be done, a lot of work to be done. And I, and I guess I'm always going to push the conversation that direction. I'm always going to push it towards, like, the fundamental, because that's, that's for me what it's about. Fun, to me, it's fundamentally a human rights issue. And fundamentally, I just, I see the oppression. And to me, it's like, that's something that I want to fight to end. And, and why do you perceive it as a human rights issue? Because it is. <laughs> and why is it a human rights issue? Like, what makes it a human rights issue? Um, well, I, I believe uh, that um, I believe in freedom, right? And this is what we as Americans tout all the time so much that we believe in freedom. And if freedom doesn't include, uh, if I, I, to me, fundamentally, freedom means I have the right to put into my own body what I choose to put into my own body alter my consciousness however I choose to alter my consciousness and some external authority be it the DEA the FDA or whoever Donald Trump does not have any authority to tell me what I can and cannot do with my body and my mind and that is a fundamental human right that that I have and that every human has to alter our own bodies and minds and anytime that a government or any other person for that matter steps in the way of that and is putting human beings behind bars for choosing to do what they want to do with themselves, that is oppression. That is human rights violation. That is a fundamental injustice. And I agree. And I totally agree. And I think it's important that, you know, this this is in, in one way in which the conversation has started to be constructed is um, specific to psychedelics. You know, Graham Hancock has talked about this, as have others, really the oppression of specifically getting back to, to psychedelics, the oppression sure. is, is almost like a war on consciousness. And we could also tie mm -hmm. this to other substances as well. And this war on consciousness is a direct result of largely the you know military industrial complex that we live in, this this patriarchal society that we live in, this this society that, that emphasizes and focuses on materialism and, and consumerism and infinite growth, this age of separation as Charles Eisenstein has has called it, and part of facilitating this transition into the next story or the next age is, you know, making it very clear that this is a fundamental violation of our right as human being. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, we're fighting against decades of propaganda. And so it's a uh... And it's challenging, right? And I think that brings up an interesting point, you know, because I think so many in the psychedelic world, so many people uh, in the psychedelic world are hanging their hat on the research that's being done. But it's going to take way more than just research to really push this conversation forward and change this conversation. Right, exactly. And like I think it's wonderful I, that this research is happening, it's great, and it's helping them with the conversation. Yeah, okay, 
now we can show we have the science to back up you know what we've already known for thousands of years but now we have the science lens showing us oh wow okay so psilocybin can help people with anxiety depression with addiction with all these different things um and it's great that the research is happening and i fully support it um but like you said yeah it's there's broader discussion too so those are that's one voice that's important incredibly important towards changing hearts changing minds and i think in addition to that i i think we are selling ourselves short if we predicate our right to use these on their being proven FDA approved medical uses for these things. Like, you know, to me, it's more fundamental than that. I think it's like, so it's both. It's, I'm great. I'm glad the research is happening. It is helping to move the conversation forward. But I also, I don't, I, I, I'm not hinging my right to use these things on the fact that there's medical use. Right. Absolutely. Because as we said, that goes back to the conversation that we were having earlier that still leads to the stigmatization and the criminalization of substances like crystal meth, like heroin, mm -hmm. like uh, methamphetamines, like, you know, all these other ones. And it's progress in the right direction. It's by acknowledging the benefits of these, we are moving in the right direction. And, you know, with the mental health crisis that especially in the United States, we have with the overprescription of, of pharmaceuticals, you know, these are right. coming at a very, very good time, psychedelic specifically. Yeah. And, and the other thing I'll add too is like, again, I'm very much looking at like, are we reproducing systems of oppression and control with a different name, with a different form? And like, so it's great. By all means, I want there to be uh, FDA approved ways to use psilocybin. You know, I want there to be those spaces where you can go and you can legally have a licensed person administer and sit with you and do this session like what I had when I was in a hopium study is that I want more people to have access to those kind of containers to do it it's a beautiful container but I also fundamentally am going to push back on the idea that that is the only appropriate container where you can do a psychedelic you're only allowed to do a psychedelic if you do it at it at a you know this specific thing that's government licensed and FDA approved and this specific methodology like you know what maybe I want to go into the jungle and be with a shaman and drink a cup and do it in a different use a completely different paradigm to interact with the psychedelics i think we run the risk with the medicalization stuff i mean yes by all means create those medical containers and spaces but i i think we need to be wary of of trying to say well this is the only authorized container to do it in you know and we run that that's a risk we run uh, where we're going that's probably how it's going to happen at first there will only be this one authorized container where you can legally do mdma without fear of government coming in to you. And I want that container to exist, just can't be the only one. It can't be, but as, as you made a note of with Obama's quote about, you know, sometimes progress, you know, it, it doesn't happen in a straight line or sometimes it's slower than we'd like. It can be incremental in nature. And like we saw with the medicalization of cannabis, oh. seems to happen with medicalization of, of previously illicit substances is by medicalizing them, uh, helps people and communities become more comfortable with them. And mm -hmm. by helping communities become more comfortable with them, it helps them to actually assess them without having their uh, assessment be impeded by propaganda and misinformation. Um, in other yep. words, you know, when people, for example, let's, let's, I mean, talking about PTSD, right? Like PTSD is a huge fucking issue in the United States because we are this warmongering nation. And if MDMA, which we just got approval for the phase three trials, if it gets medicalized for PTSD, well, now all of a sudden within this container that, that people are taking it, they're going to start to, to talk about the benefits that they've had in, in, in really overcoming these this trauma that they've had in the past. They're going to tell their friends about it. They're going to tell their family about it. And as those people start to really understand the truth then about these substances, that's when then some of these like decriminalization acts happen. That's when then legislation starts to get pushed through about, okay, we should actually legalize and regulate it. And I think that's what a lot of people in the psychedelic movement are hoping for is mm -hmm. the, the eventual full legalization of psychedelic substances because like you said to have them be limited to only a medical use would be an absolute shame considering the potential for these right. in different contexts and one of my favorite authors on this is some of the academic work that ken tupper has done ken the tupper he mm -hmm. he works in the the government in victoria british columbia yeah ken's a great guy yeah he's he's a super cool guy uh mm -hmm. i met him at horizons this year and then also spoke to him at the world ayahuasca conference and you know he writes a lot about you know the use of psychedelics specifically ayahuasca as these tools for like awe and reverence and mystery 
uh, in terms of what they can bring in to like an educational perspective. And I think that for me is also really interesting. And not only from a medical model where we're treating people who have a supposed deficit, but also just from like a personal development model, living more vibrant lives, having more um, egalitarian societies, having more inclusive communities, going back to the, the racial conversation, you know, mm -hmm. psychedelics can play a tremendous role in facilitating all of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, totally agree with you. Like, it's good that it's happening because just the fact that, you know, medical does lead to more broad uses and just the fact that more people are smoking marijuana now, or maybe not more people are smoking marijuana, it might just be the same, but more marijuana in the culture influences the culture. And so, uh, yeah. I do agree with you on all that, that this, uh, it still is progress. I'm just always going to be the one to poke the holes. <laughs> Good, and we need those people, right? Because there's always more progress to be made. And I hope one time, one day in our lifetimes, you know, we don't have to have these conversations. Right. You know, and That's I think, the goal, is to make our jobs obsolete. Exactly, exactly. It is to make <laughs> our, our jobs obsolete, because ultimately we're both working within an advocacy role. I mean, not an advocacy uh -huh. role per se, but th there is a level of advocacy to it. We're trying to uh, chip away at power structures that we find to be oppressive. Uh -huh. And if one day we can wake up and psychedelics are legalized and regulated, and people have access to them equally, and people can do with them as they wish, then, you know, most of our work will be finished. But I think that there is a very, very long way until until that day arrives, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, we've got we've got a long ways to go. And I don't know how much progress is going to be made in the next eight years or four years or whatever Hopefully it is. Hopefully four years. Hopefully four. Um, but, you know, in a weird way, maybe we'll make more progress, right? Because like you mentioned earlier, like the issue of federal versus states' rights that might come to a head, and if it does, like maybe that does, uh, maybe there is a uh, an uptick in the, in more people wanting to be more localized. And, and so, do you think secession is a possibility? No, uh, you know I don't know. Have you been reading possible. any of that, like about like Dude, California, uh, like mobilizing its militia and stuff? I I didn't know it went that far. Um, I don't know what's possible anymore, man. If you asked me. Two months ago, is it possible for Donald Trump to be the president? I would have said no fucking way. <laughs> you know? But here we are. So I really have no idea what's possible. Everything is possible. Everything <laughs> is possible, especially Sab when you're on a as they say in, uh, in India. What is it? Sab Kuchmilega. Great. Everything is possible. It is. And, and I mean, these are, these are interesting times that we're living in. These are turbulent times that we're living in. These are, these are times of change. And my hope is that we can withstand the next four years by sticking together with our communities and making sure that those who are in a position that they may be oppressed are not. And um, Yeah. I think yeah, I mean, it's like I had after this result, there was definitely a part of me, that a big part of me that was like disheartened and was like, wow. And it just like hit me like this ton of bricks. I'm like, it, it affected me a lot. I'm like, wow, what does this mean? Where are we going with this? But I have since kind of, I think now I'm sort of thinking, no, it's more important than ever now to keep doing this work. It is. Uh, it's it needed. Is. And we need to stand up and, you know, and there are questions like at what point, you know, so like you talk about California seceding and galvanizing the militia and stuff. I, I don't know at what point, when do escalating measures need to be taken? I don't know the answer to that question. I think we need to be vigilant though. Keep our eye on. I, I want to be hopeful that uh, you know it's not the apocalypse. That it's not as bad as we <laughs> thought it was going to be. That it's going to be okay. Uh, but we, I think we also have to be very mindful of like if we keep our eye on what's going to be happening and adapt appropriately. Yeah. Um, a lot of questions. Resilience, right? Having mm. resilience and being adaptable. I think that's that's important. Now, what you know, tell us a little bit about what what are plans for the future for for symposia. So obviously, you guys have. You know, you did Psychedelic Stories at Horizons with Duncan Trussler, which was a fucking blast. You hosted Psychedelic Stories at, at Beyond Psychedelics. I think you've hosted a couple more events as mm -hmm. well um, since Horizons. What do you guys, you know, envision Symposia becoming kind of in the future? Where, where are you going with, with Symposia? Yeah, so um, on the event side of things, we, you've got the Psychedelic Science Conference coming up. Uh, Maps and Beckley's Psychedelic Science Conference in April in uh, Oakland. Um, so, I mean, you're going to be there? I will be there. I bought my ticket. All of you who are listening to this, you should also buy your ticket. We could do in a meetup, an event. Though. Yeah. Start some bicycle day, April 19th. Exactly. So, Symposia, we actually have like a stage that we're running like the whole time during uh, in the marketplace. 
in fact, you can actually get to the symposia stage. I, I don't think you even need to take it to the conference. It's kind of on the kind of on the outside where the marketplace is. So uh, we're gonna have stories, and uh, we're, we're we're putting together all kinds of different content. We might do some have some live podcasts recorded there. So we've got a lot of stuff in store during. We we have a big part to play in that conference. So event wise, that's a big thing we have uh, uh, on the horizon. And magazine side, you know, we're just gonna keep working on the, putting out more content. I think a big thing for us right now is, uh, you know, we're trying to uh, get our project more, get it funded, really. And so we have a crowdfunding campaign uh, that you can find at the top of our website. It's a Patreon. So unlike Kickstarter, Patreon's based on monthly, uh, small monthly donations. So you can give as little as $2 a month. And so you get a Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, uh, patreon.com slash symposia. If you support what we're doing, you know, the events, the magazine, and you can check that out and a little bit will go a long ways toward helping us uh, to keep this going and grow it further uh, to pay our, our writers and editors and everyone fair wages. And that, that's what we're trying to work towards. You know, to date, a lot of people are, people have been willing to really put time because they're passionate about this. This is something that uh, is important to a lot of people. And we've been willing to work on it. And with your support, we can keep it growing further. Perfect. So you guys are, I mean, you'll be at Psychedelic Science. You're continuing to do psychedelic stories. I mean, what type of content can we continue to expect? Because you guys have done a few great pieces in terms of like identity politics with coming out of the psychedelic closet. This most recent one that you did on diversity. Do you have any um, big plans going forward in terms of things you might roll out on the magazine and the content side? Or are you kind of... Yeah, well, that? we've got an interview with Duncan Trussell. That's hey! Be, uh, hitting soon. So uh, that'll be a fun one. Um, by the time this podcast there, it might already be on our site. Uh, we've got another conversation, a mini conversation series, is about uh, global huasca. Mm-hmm. So talking about the globalization of ayahuasca, and we have a couple perspectives on that and what are the implications of that, uh, of all that. Uh, always have more psychedelic stories in the works, uh, and we also have a big feature coming up. Uh, on psychedelic societies, and you may mention earlier, there's all these different groups around the world, right, that have emerged, psychedelic societies in Europe and the States. And so one of our writers, Zoe, she went and interviewed a whole bunch of different people from these different societies and has put together a nice big feature profiling the different groups around the world. And so that's another nice piece we've got in the works as well. Great. And, I, and what those psychedelic communities are doing is is super important. I had the opportunity to speak at um, an event at the London Psychedelic Society about microdosing about five days ago, uh, last Sunday. Mm. And it is heartening to see the number of people who are coming out to those events. So I think at that specific event, there were about 100 people who, who came out to it. And obviously, nice. Lon- yeah, London is... This London is Steve Reed's group? Yeah, this is Steve Reed's group. So I, uh, Steve was, was running it. Myself and two other people presented about um, mushrooms, and I specifically talked about microdosing. And so it's heartening to see people, you know, coming to in-person, real-person live events. I even spoke to someone at that community, and, you know, we were talking about this before we hopped in the podcast in terms of the importance of reaching people who haven't tried psychedelics before, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, reaching people who don't have any experience with these substances but are interested in them, are curious about them, have maybe understood or have come to understand that a lot of what they were told about them before actually isn't true and that there are actually these tremendous benefits from them um, using them in the correct context. So I was even talking to someone there who has, you know, directed a, a feature film, a feature documentary film that was bought out by Universal or something. He was there for for the first time just to learn about psychedelics. Uh, in fact, three of the people that I spoke to that night out of five had never done psychedelics before, um, wow. but we're at the event to meet people, to talk about They were just it. interested in it. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think yeah. if we're, we're going back, you know, to weave kind of a, a line throughout our entire conversation, one of the best ways to get involved in all these things that we're talking about is just go Find the others, you know, to, to use the, yep. the Timothy Leary phrase. Go meet other people in your or community. Find the people who aren't others yet and make them others. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Invite your friends to come to events. <laughs> Invite your friends to join your communities. Invite your friends to have these conversations. Um, or your, go yourself, you know. This is a project that we're working on right now with the third wave in terms of how do we incubate a community, or specifically a psychedelic community, get it up and going uh, in cities all across the world because while there are many, I think just over 50 at the moment, 
including some that are very well represented, like Brooklyn, the Brooklyn uh, Psychedelic Society, the San Francisco, of course, Psychedelic Society. Mm. Uh, Ashley Booth is doing the AWARE project in Los Angeles, the London Psychedelic Society. There are still a lot of major cities that don't have any sort of psychedelic society. One that comes to mind right away is Austin, Texas, which is this really? huge... Yeah, There's no don't. psychedelic society in no, Austin? which I thought was insane. I'm talking with a few people right now to try to get one up and going there because there definitely needs to be one there. But yeah, so if you're listening to this, go join your local psychedelic community. Send me an email if, if you don't know what your local psychedelic community is. In this podcast, we'll include a link to those show notes or we'll include a link in the show notes to some different resources that you can use to find one. But that I think is really important is starting to go to in-person events, making in-person relationships and connections, because that's the way that we can start to make this more inclusive. That's the way that we can start to build resilience in the face of an oncoming you know, conservative government. And ultimately, that's the way that we can really uh, build the psychedelic community to achieve you know, the things that we'd like to achieve in the future. Mm. You're here. Yeah. Okay. So I just went on my little rant and sometimes I, I tend to do that. So No, it's uh, good. That was a good one. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm really passionate about this. I think I think this is something that there are so many psychedelic users out there that feel isolated and that feel alone and that feel like they don't have anyone else to talk to about psychedelics. And that's why I think what you guys are doing at Symposia, uh, with psychedelic stories and with some of the other events that you've done in person specifically are incredibly important and will remain incredibly important because of the importance of real connection in human relationships. Mm, absolutely. So um, any final words, Mike, about Symposia, about psychedelics, about uh, your ukulele? Um, <laughs> do you have any final kind of words about anything? No, well, no, just thank you, really. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for letting me riff with you for a while about... Everything from psychedelics to drug war to whatever, <laughs> and ukuleles. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's, this was a fun little jam. We just it did. was, yeah. It was a fun little jam, and it's a nice kind of continuation of some of the conversations that we've had before. Uh, just as a note to our listeners, Mike and I both lived in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Yeah, uh, yeah we were both doing time. the digital nomad thing. The digital nomad thing. And we kind of explored those connections when we first met, have a few mutual friends. Chiang Mai will always have a special place in my heart. Yeah, it is It is. It is a great place, and I, I hope to return there again someday. So that's our connection, yeah. and now we just happen to both be working in the, the psychedelic space, hoping yeah. to, to work to bringing these tools to, to more people. So Cool. Thanks again, Mike. And if you know our listeners want to go check out Symposia, it's p s y m p o s i a dot com, and we'll include a link in the show notes. So if you guys are just listening to this on the go, then you can go to our website, The Third Wave, and we'll provide all those links. And definitely support these guys with your uh, money if you can. You know, something as little as two dollars a month really helps and goes a long way for their Patreon. And attend their events. You know, if you guys are going to psychedelic uh, psychedelic science, you know, attend the psychedelic stories. And if you live on the East Coast, I'm sure you guys will be doing events somewhat soon. Yeah, uh, we we Coast. do pretty frequently. Yeah, uh, in New York and Baltimore, absolutely. And you know, we started breaking into like the Bay Area and other spaces too. So symposia coming to a city near you. Yeah, and, and um, that's the other thing. <laughs> like, uh, you know, if anyone's listening to this this podcast and has an interest in bringing them into another city definitely yeah, shoot mike up. an email mike at symposia.com there we go all right well thanks again mike thank you thanks for listening to the psychedelia podcast with paul austin want more psychedelic information go to our website at the thirdwave.co and register for our email list and newsletter also, please consider donating to The Third Wave via our Patreon page. Donations make this podcast possible. Psychedelics have the potential to transform lives. By donating, you enable us to continue to inform people about the benefits of these powerful substances.